Good morning. Uh, welcome to Christ Presbyterian Church. We are uh, thrilled that you chose to spend your Sunday morning with us. We know there's a lot of things you could do on a Sunday morning, and the fact that you chose to be with us, uh, we don't take that for granted. So thanks for being here. My name is Brian Sorgan Fry. I'm one of the pastors on staff. We've got a few announcements, most of them on the back of your bulletin, so I'm going to run through them, but this one is not. Uh, M&M is our uh, children's program on Wednesday nights. It starts August 23rd. Here's what I'd love for you to hear. We really need volunteers. Uh, M&M is an amazing ministry to our kids. Jesus said, let the little ones come unto me. Uh, it is an easy way to serve as well. Uh, you can do it, I promise. And Elizabeth Adrian, who's right over here, uh, her contact information is online as well. If you are at all interested in serving on Wednesday nights, uh, she makes it easy for you to serve. We need volunteers. That'd be great. Second of all, uh, you'll see all the women's stuff going on this week. That means we have Pilates tomorrow night at 7 o'clock in the youth room. Uh, seventh grade uh, and up can come, bring them out. Uh, then Tuesday, uh, we are having our men's lunch. We said we'd do it once in June, once in July before we start kicking off weekly in August. So it'll be here noon. We're going to have Chick-fil-A just show up. Uh, we look at a scripture together. We meet uh, each other. Uh, we discuss that passage and you are out by 1245, uh, I promise, uh, so you can get back to work. Uh, third, you'll see also Women on Wednesdays is happening. That is uh, here at 1030, there's no agenda other than making a friend or deepening friendships and just having conversation with each other. And then that night, Wednesday night at 530 uh, at Lauren Jones' house, we have several women that are involved in ministry on campus at Ole Miss. And so what they're doing on these nights is telling stories of God's faithfulness on campus, of how God is at work both on campus and in their own life. And so Grace McKissick with Young Life, Kitty Hurdle with Crew, and Rachel Causey with FCA will all be speaking. Uh, again, women of all ages, come, hear how God's at work. So with that, uh, I would ask you to stand, uh, and we will be called to worship. We're going through Apostles' Creed, and uh, we'll talk about center on how Jesus Christ our Lord uh, is what we're going to talk about. So we're going to be called to worship from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commands. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let's now sing together, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven.
Join me in prayer. Let's pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one, you have revealed yourself to us in creation. You revealed yourself to us in the scriptures, and you have revealed yourself to us by the word become flesh, your eternal Son, Jesus. And so we are here this morning because we can actually know you. And when we look at Jesus, we see exactly what you are like, that you are holy and just and wise and good and true. There is no life or joy apart from you. You are our prophet, our priest, and our king. And so we delight to worship you this morning. So we ask, Holy Spirit, would you illumine our hearts this morning so that we see Jesus more clearly, that we walk with Jesus more nearly? We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. Amen. We're now going to affirm our faith from the Heidelberg Catechism that also uh, walks through Uh, the Apostles' Creed, which we are preaching through. So here is, why is the Lord Jesus called Christ, meaning anointed? Because Because he has has been been ordained ordained by God God the Father Father, and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance. Our Our only high high priest, priest, who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body, and who continually pleads our cause with the Father, and our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit, and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. Let's remain standing as we continue singing together. Until she finds 
James uh, calls us to confession in James 4, and um, he asks a rhetorical question, what causes quarrels and fights among you? And uh, sometimes the answer irritates me because I always want to think it's, it's those people that causes quarrels and fights. And yet James does what the scripture so often says, uh, it turns uh, the light on myself. And uh, a Christian embraces that when you see destruction and things in the world, you say, I think I'm part of the problem. Uh, but doesn't end there. We confess that and then realize there's a God who loves us and forgives us and is uh, healing us. So uh, we are called to confess from, from James 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people... Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If you'd like, you can confess your sin together with us. Almighty God, you have crowned Jesus Christ as Lord of all. Yet we confess that we have not bowed down to him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the way of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin, that we may be your faithful people, obeying the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. Amen. I have a time of silent confession. Amen. May lift up your heads and stand up and receive the assurance of forgiveness that is yours in Christ Jesus, guaranteed from Hebrews 4. Since, we, since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's continue singing together before the throne of God above.
at this time, we'd like to uh, invite Alan Cochet forward. Alan is uh, with MTW to France, uh, and he's going to be giving us a little bit of an update today. Uh, so, uh, Alan. Thank you so much. It's a privilege uh, for us to be here. Uh, well, let me pray for us to begin with. Father, we thank you today for the Lord Jesus Christ, and I thank you for this church and for their heart for Christ and for their love for missions. And we pray even today you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, you would exalt the name of Christ, and you would give us a vision to reach your world. For Christ's sake we pray, amen. First of all, it's a privilege for Ann and me to be here today, and I want to just simply say thank you. Uh, you've been a part of this ministry since we first went to France, and uh, we are deeply grateful uh, for your partnership with us. In fact, we're getting ready to see a short video that you helped uh, Natalie uh, Wood Matthews come to France and make for us. She's made several videos for us, and this is one of them, and we're very grateful because this will give you a little picture of just a part of what we're doing and part of the work that's going on right now in Toulouse. So let's just take a few moments and, and take a look at this video. Church planting is a key element in Mission of the World's effort to impact the world for Jesus Christ. And one of the places that impact is being felt today is in France, as MTW's church planting teams are working with French national partners to plant healthy, vibrant churches in France. They're engaging the culture, reaching out into the communities, and viscerally living out the gospel of Jesus Christ, neighbor to neighbor, heart to heart. One of those exciting church planting efforts is in Toulouse, France, where a team of MTW missionaries is working with a French national church partner in an effort to revitalize an older downtown church and plant a new church in a nearby suburb. People think of France and they think of the Eiffel Tower and bread and cheese and wine and all the fun stuff you get when you vacation here. We're here in Toulouse, a city of, of nearly three million people. We live in the, in the southwest side where there's over, where there's over 600,000 people in total, and there's no evangelical church here. Toulouse is, a, is an interesting dynamic because it's uh, both a big city and a lot of suburbs. It's a city of technology. They've got the Airbus plant here and uh, universities, and it's a, definitely an educated city. The evangelical Christian population in France is, is less than 2%, and depending on who you're talking to, probably less than 1%. That would mean that out of every 100 people, one of them is a believer. I mean, at a school of, of 300 children, perhaps three of them are, are Christian. Uh, the need is great. The need is, is, is enormous um, here. There is a need for the gospel um, that has it's been absent for a long time. People are hungry for it. Uh, mm -hmm. They need the truth. They need, they need something more substantial than just living and dying and, and, and what comes next. So it's a really amazing opportunity to, to be here and to work here. If you think God might be calling you to partner with us in serving Christ in France, we invite you to contact us to hear more about how you can be a part of what God is doing there. On May 27th in 1564, when Calvin died, his last words were a Bible verse from Psalm 13, how long, O oh Lord? That's still the echo of many Christians for France today. How long? How long, O oh Lord, before you do a mighty work? I want to tell you that today, despite a devastating war in the Ukraine, the residual impacts of the pandemic, enormous economic and political turmoil, and the constant threat of terrorism, the Lord is working in France. And it's a thrilling thing to see. It's a thrilling see, thing to see a young French PhD student come to faith in Christ, make a profession of faith, join the church, grow in his faith, and become a leader in a church plant that's now thriving in Paris. It's a thrilling thing to work beside a compassionate Christian and a group of volunteers in Belleville, the Belleville area of Paris, 
as they compassionately share Christ and serve a hundred meals morning and evening to hungry and homeless men and women in Paris. It's a thrilling thing to gra- gather with a church plant and worship with them in Lyon, France, and see a young French pastor, a Huguenot descendant, by the way, who is now an ordained PCA teaching elder, with a sanctuary full of people longing to hear the gospel come to faith and grow in their walk with Christ. It's a thrilling thing to be at the seminary in Aix-en-Provence that, that Jim Boyce and Ed Clowney helped start and hear the students talking excitedly about a class, a professor, or the ministry they're hoping to see launched. It's exciting to sit down in Paris with the, the RUF team from Harvard University and hear them talking about what God could do in impacting campuses across France. You won't hear about this on the news. You won't read about it in the tourist guides. But I want you to know the Lord is working in France. And we could go on and on and on. I could tell you about uh, Daniel and Katie Brink who are in Belgium and Brussels right now doing an exciting work. Or one of the interns at the parish church who's now going to be doing a church plant in Lille. Or one thing after another. But, but let me say this about it. That all being said, the labor in France is hard. The challenges are many, and the needs are great. That's why MTW has asked us to do what we do as a Barnabas ministry team. And Anne and I have a job, and our job is simply in France to encourage and support missionaries and pastors, to encourage and support compassion ministries and church planters, to encourage and support seminary professors and campus ministries. And it's an exciting thing to do. And then to come home and begin to build awareness of the needs, opportunities, and challenges and seek to recruit and build support for the work going on there. And we're grateful for your participation in that. We have two quick acronyms that we have for our work over there. We're the help. I borrowed that from a Mississippi author, by the way. Um, We're the help. We hear hearts, encourage, love, and pray with our people there. And then when we're home, we're the band. We try to build awareness. We try to network, and we try to develop recruits and prayer and support partners for the work of the kingdom in France. And we are very, very grateful for Christ's prayers and your participation with us in that work. As many of you know, Christ's prayers is a beacon of light for the gospel of Jesus Christ here in Oxford. And we are particularly grateful that you're also a ray of hope for the work of Christ in France. And I thank you for the privilege to be here. And we'll be outside afterwards if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Good morning, I'm Robert Dunlap, and I'm privileged to serve as one of your deacons. As the ushers come forward, I'd like to remind you, you can also give using the basket at the back of the sanctuary on the Church Center app or on the Church Center website. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to join our brothers and sisters in Christ in worshiping you by giving back from the bounty that you have given us. Please accept these tithes and offerings and bless them to the furtherance of your kingdom in our communities and throughout the world. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.
Good morning, my name is Nathan Ewell. I'm one of the elders here at Christ Perez. At this time, three and four year olds can be dismissed over here to the right. Um, parents can pick them back up at this door at the beginning of the last hymn. Uh, join me now as we pray together uh, for the needs of our body. Heavenly Father, thank you for this body of believers. You have transformed our hearts, given us new life. Yet even, our, even in our state of redemption, we d- dwell in the consequences of sin. Do not let our jealousy or our pride separate us from one another. Do not let our fear, apathy, and distrust limit our engagement. Let no one walk away in shame or discouragement, loneliness or bitterness, but let all enjoy being valued as fellow children of the eternal Almighty Father. We are a people of little faith, but we are your people, and your promises ring true for us through all eternity. Be our strength today. Grant us mercies to love one another well. Let us serve one another in humility. Use this body in the service of your kingdom. For the grieving hearts, help us to sit with them in their mourning. Comfort Miss Margaret Sims, who lost her husband and son. Thank you for the trailers and the Castons and the Ingrams and the many others who have loved her well. Help us to know how to continue to minister to her. We pray for the Maxies, for Johnny who lost his father earlier this summer and now for Emily um, as she deals with her father battling dementia. We pray for Brian Simmons' sister who is critically ill in Michigan. We pray for spiritual and physical healing. Um, Work in that family. Help them to know you, to see your presence. Give Brian and and wisdom in how they speak to the family. And for Jill Gardner's mother, Suzanne Johnson, who is awaiting a heart cath this afternoon. Be with her. Remove any anxiety as she prepares for her procedure. Help the health care team provide compassionate and effective care. For Kevin and Jill Gardner as members of the week, and for Lisa Gathright, we thank you for their long history of service to your church, for their active role in getting things done. For Kevin and Jill, they praise you for your mercies and redeeming love. Be with their family abroad, protect them, and grant them times of rich connection. Continue to show Lisa ways that she can serve your church and let your will be done in any decision she makes. We pray for Lois Paney with InterVarsity. Equip their new leaders with courage and help them to know how they can best care for the new students this fall. Thank you for Joe and Melanie Taylor with Crew Valor. Bless their attendance at a conference next week along with two cadets. Lay the groundwork for a student-led movement to start ministries on Memphis and Mississippi State campuses. Thank you for the ways in which you have used the Griggs and Brian Simmons in this ministry. We pray that the growth of their daughter Everly's tumor has stopped, that chemo is effective, and that she will recover recently loss of movement in her left arm and leg. For Jonathan Fulcher and FCA at Ole Ole Miss, continue to use them and his staff to mentor and equip and share the love of Christ. For our leadership this week, Brett and Meg Barefoot, thank you for their willingness to serve, use their gifts to help our church flourish. And for our Sunday school teachers, William and Mary Alice Sanders and Daniel and Julie Spears, use the seeds planted over this last year in the hearts of these four and five-year-olds. Lastly, speak through Les this morning as he brings us your word about your holy and blameless son who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 13. You can find it on page 822 in your, hymn, in your pew Bible. And after six days, is that right? Yeah, sorry. (laughs) And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. 
And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, one of my uh, favorite lines from, this is a Brian Sorgan Fry opening illustration, because I think this is his favorite movie, Hoosiers. My favorite lines from Hoosiers um, is at the very beginning of the movie where Coach Dale has shown up to practice, but the old coach is there, who's kind of been the stand-in, fill-in guy, and there's this great sort of exchange of dialogue where Coach Dale kind of cuts to the chase and is like, look, let's be real friendly here. My name is Norman, and your coaching days are over. And of course, George has to respond to this, and he looks and replies to him something along the lines of, look, mister, there's, a, there's two kinds of dumb. You know, the first is that a guy gets naked and runs out in the snow and barks at the moon. Uh, the second does the same thing in my living room. The first one, he says, don't matter. But the second one, you're kind of forced to deal with. Now, like, I realize that George is sort of the villain in the movie, of course, not beyond redemption, interestingly enough, if you've never seen it. But I want to sort of submit to you this morning that there's actually a little bit of wisdom in what George just said. Some wisdom there that you can discover, which is that most of the things that happen to us in the world, we can kind of take or leave. I'm not really even necessarily required to have an opinion about it, but every now and then, Something happens, someone says something that you're kind of forced to deal with. Well, we've come now to this middle portion of the Apostles' Creed where we begin to get a lot of information about the nature of who Jesus is. And what you get are these lists of really profound declarations about his nature and how important he is in our lives. And for some of us, as we read through the Creed and recite it week in and week out, we think that that looks really obvious. Well, of course, everybody knows who Jesus is, we think, right? But if that's the case, you're not paying attention. Because the truth is, in our day, there are lots of Jesuses out there. Uh, there is the Jesus of the world religions who are more than happy to ascribe to him the title, a great teacher. The atheist stands up and thinks, of course, he's a dangerous, God-complex psycho. Uh, still others, Jesus is the, the, the comic character of of bumper sticker sloganeering or something to that effect, or perhaps even some sort of a cable access freak programming followers or something. There's lots of Jesuses out there. But no matter what your opinion of who Jesus is this morning, you're going to find that there are stories about him that are of a nature that simply force you to deal with him. Absolutely. In other words, the content of Jesus' claims leaves you with limited choices as to what you are going to think about him. This is where he gives you a chance to drag out one of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes about the nature of Jesus and how people process him. <laughs> Listen to what he says. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, which is, well, you know, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a, as a great moral teacher, but <laughs> I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis says, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be a devil of hell. You must make your choice. 
either this man was and is the son of God, or else he is a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, and you can, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any of this patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. Listen to this line. He has not left that open for us. He did not intend to. So look, as we look this summer at this question of why believing matters by looking at faith's object, we need to consider what it meant for us to confess that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, our Lord, that he's the Messiah. And in order for people to sort of wrap their mind around that amazing claim, Jesus provides stories like the one that we just read in Matthew 17 to back this up. Now, I think there's only two things I want you to draw from this idea. The first one is to see the majesty of Jesus, and then we'll work on some application in the ministry of Jesus. Three sub points under the first point. That's kind of my biggest. You'll get used to it. You'll follow it. I want to start with this question of Jesus' majesty. What exactly is happening here? I do realize that for us, we read these stories so often that we kind of have them in the same category that we do with little children's books. These are myths, right, that those people back in those days, because, you know, they were really primitive, and uh, those kind of people just believed those sorts of things that people would, I don't know, start to glow and shine. Um, for, the, for the sake of this discussion, that's just not historically accurate. Uh, historians will be very careful to explain to you <laughs> that, indeed, it was just as weird for a man to start to glow uh, 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 or to speak to people who apparently had been dead for hundreds of years that was just as weird back then as it would have happened now, right? The intention of this is to arrest our attention and to make us begin to think. <clears throat> so let's set it in context here for a second, because Jesus has just uncorked to his disciples the nature of his mission. And what he's going to say is, is I am not here for the reasons you think that I am. You know, his disciples are sitting thinking to themselves, excellent, Jesus is here, he's going to clean house, He's going to take over, and he's going to set us up as the national power that we know we're supposed to have been. But instead, Jesus starts talking about dying and rising from the dead, which is not what the disciples had on their life plan bingo game, right? They don't get it. Of course, when the story gets told in Mark, it's really interesting. As they're on their way down Mount Hermon, it says that they discuss themselves what rising from the dead might mean. They didn't get it. In other words, what they're saying is our life is not looking like what we thought it would look like in following Jesus. I had a life plan, Jesus. What are you talking about with all of this suffering and death business? And pause here for a moment before we get to some of these sub points here. You do realize that's the way Jesus works. We have to wrap our mind around this because Jesus has an agenda for our lives he is leading you almost certainly into places that are not going to fit within your present moral frameworks. It's just not. And for that reason, there's, there's almost a bravery for those people who have said, I'm going to go follow Jesus. Because if he is who he said he was, and not a lunatic like Lewis was encouraging us to consider, if he is who he said he was, then the more that you begin to sort of examine and scrutinize Jesus, the more you begin to realize that he is the one scrutinizing you. There's no casual relationship with this Jesus. And so Christianity, I would say, is not for the faint of heart. And so Jesus brings them this experience, this intense experience, to unpack all that for them, to show them just exactly who they're dealing with. And so the first thing that you see happening is, is Jesus' countenance changes right? This is not a light that's shining on him. It's a light that's shining from him. <laughs> and we also don't get the sense that it's sort of a, I don't know, warm, pleasant glow coming off of him. No, it was like looking into the sun. You couldn't do it for too long. It was too much. And it was absolutely terrifying. And again, once you sort of place this into the story of Jesus, you'll realize what he's doing. And it occurred to me as I was thinking about this, of what it was like uh, when my, my children were little, especially my son Luke. Bear with me, he's right here. Um, when Luke was little bitty, one of the things he really wanted to do when daddy would come home was to wrestle. He had to wrestle with daddy. But if you've ever sort of been with little toddlers, right, you realize that as a dad, you kind of got to restrain yourself a little bit, don't you? 
you know, he's too small. You might actually hurt him. But do you remember those times where in their little three- and four-year-old selves, they, they just got a little uppity, you know? You know a, little, a little too big for their britches. And you just kind of had to sort of, sort of flex a little bit. You know, kind of let a little bit go, just so he's aware of exactly who it is that he's messing with. Remember those times? By the way, those days are long since over. I wouldn't mess with my son for all the tea in China right now. But the point is, Jesus is going to his disciples and showing them that for me to appear to you as I have been doing all this time, human, meek, approachable, that has taken an enormous amount of restraint on his part. That's what he's saying. This is who Jesus was from before the foundations of the earth. This was the second person of the Trinity who dwelt with God in unapproachable light. So while he's walking around with them, he's having to hold that back. But here in this moment on the mountain with these, uh, with these uh, disciples, he just pulls the veil back just a little bit. He just flexes a little bit. He lets a little bit of it go. So the disciples suddenly start to be like, whoa, we didn't know who we were dealing with when we came to that. That's what Jesus is doing. You know, one of my favorite other stories about this happens in the book of Mark chapter 4, where Jesus and his disciples find themselves on a boat on a lake in the midst of a stormy squall, right? Water's coming over the sides, the wind's blowing, it's threatening to capsize the whole thing. And what is Jesus doing? <laughs> He's asleep through the whole deal. And of course, the disciples you know, rouse him real quickly and challenge him on whether he even cares that they die. Jesus, you can imagine, sort of groggily sits up and he looks around at the waves over him. He's like, be quiet. And suddenly there's dead calm. I love that story because the disciples only thought that they had the storm to worry about, didn't they? No. What they realized was that the storm was nothing compared to who they suddenly realized they had in the boat with them. That was the difference. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 says that Jesus is the one who upholds the universe by his power. You realize what that means? It means that the reason why Jesus could quiet the waves around him is because he was the one who was telling them to blow in the first place. It's all into his power. Jesus doesn't go up to the mountain and look at his disciples and say anything like, hey, 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 guys, get ready. Watch this. He's not grandstanding at all. All he's doing is he's just, he's just, he's letting a little bit go. So the disciples know that your future, I promise you, as confusing as it feels right now, as unknown as your next few years around me and following me are going to be, you don't have any idea who you're, who you're standing with. Do you have any idea of the power? Let me just show you a little bit. So his countenance gives us this great insight into it. Secondly, though, we also see in his majesty in the company around him. This is really amazing. And, and honestly, weird. Uh, Jesus went on a mountain with some of his disciples, and it begins to glow, and you're like, what? He's glowing? Oh, and then Moses and Elijah show up, and you're like, of course they did. Why, why wouldn't people have been dead for a few hundred years or so to show up? What does that mean? Well, beside being freaked out, how did the disciples know that that's who they were? Did Jesus identify? Did they shake hands? What was that like? I don't know. But what it's supposed to do is to say something significant. And this is not that hard to determine. Moses and Elijah clearly represent a common designation for the way in which New Testament believers would have referred to the Old Testament. Right? They would have talked about the Old Testament as if it is the law and the prophets. That was the common phraseology to talk about the Old Testament as you and I refer to it. So the point is, is whenever God was doing these amazing things, he often did it on high mountains. Glory took place up there. So the reason why Moses and Elijah show up is because we're trying to establish that Jesus is here on the basis of everything that you've known up until this time, spiritually speaking. Commentator Kent Hughes put it this way. He said, why Elijah and Moses? Why not Isaiah uh, and Jeremiah? He says, well, there's several reasons. Both these men had previously conversed with God on mountaintops. Moses, of course, on Mount Sinai, Elijah on Mount Horeb. Both of these men had been shown God's glory. Both had famous departures from the earth. Moses gets buried on Mount Nebo in a grave nobody can see. Elijah gets taken up in a chariot of fire. Remember all that? Moses was a great lawgiver. Elijah the great prophet. Moses was the founder of Israel's religious economy. And Elijah was the restorer of it. Let's do this last sentence. Together, 
they were the ultimate summary of the Old Testament economy. That's it. That's why Moses and Elijah show up with Jesus. Because what he's doing is, is Jesus is appealing to these two most prominent Old Testament representatives to say to his people, everything that I am here doing is part of the plan. And it's going to look in a few weeks like there is no plan. Or at least that the plan went off off the rails. And it hasn't. Everything in the Bible has been leading up to me. Jesus is trying to show his followers about his finality. So part of the majesty that you get in the story of the transfiguration is Jesus assuring his people to say, look, all of the roads of your life end in me. It all terminates here. Every path you've been taking, every question you've been asking, every art that you've been enjoying, it's ultimately going to trace itself back to me. That's what I'm here about. Thirdly and finally, the majesty we see in the cloud. This is a big one. Suddenly this cloud sort of comes down. Now look, the cloud is a fairly common Bible image, right? The Old Testament believers used to call it the Shekinah glory of God. It was when God showed up in his most tangible form uh, uh, in the Old Testament to speak. Remember all these things. Remember, it, it was, the cloud was also the pillar of fire at night, leading the Israelites through the uh, wilderness in Exodus 13. The cloud was the one who, who passed by Moses when God covered him in a cleft of a rock and proclaimed his name to him uh, in Exodus uh, 40. Uh, th- th- excuse me, 33. The cloud was the one who entered the tent of meeting and kept the, the priest and Moses from being, being able to enter it. Later on, Moses, uh, Solomon builds another humongous temple, and the cloud shows up on dedication day. Remember that from 1 Kings 8? Ezekiel, we know, saw a symbolic cloud rise from over the Ark of the Covenant to the threshold of the temple because of Israel's apostasy. Ezekiel 8. A few months after the story that we're reading here happened, Jesus actually would leave the earth on a cloud in Acts chapter 1. And then we're reassured that those who know Jesus by faith will actually meet him in the cloud in the air as it descends to bring in the last days. We get that out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You see the parallels there? The parallels between the Old Testament Yahweh and Jesus could not have been more explicit. So the reaction, though, is what I find interesting because the disciples look at it and they are terrified by it. Absolutely terrified. Why? Because they understood that from the Old Testament example, when God showed up this way, it almost always was fatal. The cloud was the thing that you saw, not in some benign sort of dewy mist that sort of came down around you to give you a warm fuzzy. No, it was the precursor. It was the last thing that you saw before you were dead. That's what it meant. You know, we all watched in horror, did we not, at the reports that came back in June from the sunken submersible full of all those uh, wealthy explorers who wanted to see the wreck of the Titanic. And as it became clear that the sub had imploded and been completely destroyed, morbid curiosity just took over the internet and everybody wanted to know exactly what in the world it might have been like for those people to perish in that particular way. But wasn't it weird how much of a consolation it was for us when we were told, certainly as reassurance, that the immediacy of that implosion would have given the passengers of that craft about zero time to know what was happening. We consoled ourselves with things like, you know what, they never knew what happened. They had no idea. Now here's my question. Why was that comforting? Why is that comforting? I would submit that The reason is that when you have time to contemplate what's about to happen to you, the dread and the fear and the panic and the inevitability can almost be worse than the fate that's awaiting you. It's the build up to it. And that is exactly where the disciples find themselves. They're sitting there in that moment and they're looking up and realizing that they're now standing before God himself. All of their spiritual accounts being called, all of their deeds laid open to them, all of their faults exposed, and knowing that they deserve the death sentence. Yeah, they were afraid in that moment of the cloud. Now look, we could go on with these implications of this really amazing story. But I simply just want to make one note before we go to the last point, and it's simply this. Whenever you have a Jesus like this that's described in the New Testament the way he is, 
you don't ask him into your life to be your personal assistant. That doesn't fit. Jesus is not a passive force. Outsiders of the faith will look at you and be like, cool, you're into the Jesus thing. That's really great for you. I'm not that spiritual, but I'm glad you found something that makes you feel fulfilled. No, no the only way you can talk that way is if you've never seen the claims that Jesus made about himself. And I always try to encourage people, if you or your loved ones are walking away from Christianity, fine. But at least reject the, general, the, the genuine article and not some sort of smarmy, good teacher image that we cook up and uh, console ourselves with. One last thing, though, I do think that needs to be said for those who actually feel like we're trying to follow Jesus. It means that taking Jesus' name on our lips and confessing him as our Savior and our Lord is a wild-eyed, downright imperialistic claim over every square inch of your life. Back to Hebrews 1. Describing Jesus, it says, He is the heir of all things through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name that he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. We've... You've, you've heard us talk about, especially towards the end of the, uh, the Life of David series, about what it looks like for God's people to draw near to the Lord. Those psalms were incredibly helpful for me as we began to think about them. What does it mean for me to draw near to Jesus and for him to be accessible to me, to, for him to be near? What do I mean by that? But it also occurs to me as we begin to think about that, we also have to be careful that we're not projecting onto him what we think he's like. That is, that what he's become in our minds is a figment of our imagination, not informed by the Bible, but more our wish projections on what we wish he would be to us and in us. That doesn't work. That's so why we need these stories. I think the story screams at us to take a very careful stock every time we dare to approach him in prayer, or approach him in the sanctuary for that matter, of who it is that we're so casually invoking. <laughs> who is this God? Christians follow no impotent sovereign, but the majestic, terrifying Jesus, God's only Son, our Lord. That's why we confess it. But that brings me to the, to the wrap-up here on the ministry of Jesus. Because <clears throat> that's not the end of this story. Interestingly enough, you should be asking yourself a question, given the nature of what we just unpacked. Okay, so if the death sentence came with the cloud... Why did they survive it? Why are they there? Why are they not dead? And the answer is because of Jesus' words. Jesus looked at them and said, rise, have no fear. And so what Jesus puts in front of the disciples is an heretofore unheard of situation. That is, how can you have the holy, terrifying presence of God in your midst and not be afraid of it? How does that happen? How can Jesus say that? How can you hold the lightning in your hand? How do you contemplate the incomprehensible? How do you draw blood from the, most fe from the fiercest warrior who ever lived? And then you get to verse 9, and Jesus starts talking about keeping all this information under wraps until he's risen from the dead. Remember, they have no idea what he's talking about in that moment. But our passage mentions that they start talking about the resurrection. It gets the disciples thinking about Elijah, who they had just seen. The prophecies were there that he would show up before the Messiah returns. Is that right, Jesus? Is that what we're expecting? And Jesus says, no, the prophecy about Elijah was metaphorical. The Elijah who was to come was actually the one who was to prepare the culture for the Messiah's arrival. And John the Baptist was the one who fulfilled that role. But Jesus uses that cue to start to explain about his impending death. So in verse 12, he says, So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. So yeah, Jesus definitely gets started thinking about a death sentence. It's just not their death sentence. It's his death sentence that he's going to face. And what you're going to find is the rest of the Gospel of Matthew, which by the way, this is our first introduction to it, Brian and I have planned and, 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 and intend to go through the entirety of the Gospel of Matthew uh, this coming fall and spring. 
It's been five years since we've done a gospel, and we want to do one every five years, and so we're going to launch through that. But here's what I think you're going to find. Jesus is going to set up his ministry, especially the, the pinnacle of his ministry among us, as being something to go in and say, I am here to face the thing that you are the most afraid of. I'm going to face it. I'm going to take it on. And when I do, and when I convince you that I have, I will show you that you can survive my majesty. And not only survive it, but now be comforted by it. And now to actually take joy in it rather than be terrified by it. That's the fundamental shift of the transfiguration Jesus is predicting. I'm going to suffer in such a way that is going to bring out of my suffering you not having to be afraid. Rise and don't be afraid. That's what he's going to say. So it reminded me of um, back on Memorial Day. It's become sort of a little bit of a tradition in my home that on Memorial Day we, we watch um, Band of Brothers, the great sort of classic of the 101st Airborne as they land and parachute on the day of on d-day and watch them march all through um france and belgium and into germany <clears throat> it's a really amazing sort of series one of my favorite scenes there is when the when the 101st has sort of found themselves tasked with sort of uprooting a, a very entrenched german line uh, with tanks that are threatening to start to advance but there's this great moment after they're sort of getting decimated and blown away where you suddenly hear the air start to crackle there's wood that's being splintered over, and all of a sudden, from across their enemy's flank, come the Allied tanks. And the way in which the whole thing is shot, it's sort of that jumpy cam sort of thing that goes on. I realized you can almost feel the relief inside you when you begin to realize that the tide has turned. That all of a sudden, that great force that I hear is actually coming to help me. That's illustrative, isn't it? Because I really do think that's what this story is intending to do in Jesus' followers. Because believing in Jesus matters supremely, does it not? Because only in him do you see the suffering sovereign. That's the uniqueness of Jesus. Because as he comes and reveals himself, he's saying, look, all of that power, just that little flex that we got, that glory, that majesty. What Christians have come to believe is that all of that, that immensity has been mustered and garnered for me. That that guy's fighting on my side. That's our team. <laughs> We're on the winning side. And what God calls Jesus' followers to do because of stories like this is to realize that Jesus has fashioned for you an impenetrable salvation. And his majesty is bearing witness to the fact that as he suffers, he comes and offers to people something that cannot be assailed by our experiences, by our failures, by the world, by the pressures that come in around us an unassailable center that Jesus is garnering and putting together. And what he says to us, and I think what the creed says to us, and the reason why we recite it over and over again, is because he wants us to think about it, to mull it over, <laughs> to carve out time where I look back and think to myself, what exactly does that mean? Where maybe I join a small group this fall as we get them all cranked back up so that I can talk with other people about what that means. How do I apply that? What does that passage mean? How does that apply to me? Who knows what we might do? What we're trying to do is to fashion us into a people who actually are ready to say, okay, Lord Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you want to go as long as you're on my side. I think that's his invitation to us this morning is to begin to think, to mull over. What would it mean for Jesus to come and reveal his majesty to us? Let's pray. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you would do it now, perhaps not in the visible way in which it happened so many thousands of years ago, but maybe in the way in which you promised it would happen by your Holy Spirit. Father, there's probably someone in this room who is thinking through this, perhaps even for the first time. And maybe you, Father, in your grace and your glory can reveal to them that indeed there is something fascinating there. There is a light, and it's terrifying, sure, because it suggests that we might have to lose control. But frankly, our lives weren't all that great with, with us in control in the first place. So for that soul, Father, who who desperately needs you, would you draw them to yourself? Even as we're speaking, 
May we and they stand and sing at the glory and the joy that might come from Jesus actually meeting them in this place at that time. Would you do that as we sing? Or we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's do that and stand and sing the next hymn.
Thank you all for coming. I, I feel like I see a lot of new faces out there. So, hey, members, make sure you greet somebody around you if you don't know them or recognize their face. It's a good time to say hello. We're always delighted that you're here. Now, look, I don't want to throw anybody off, okay? But next week, we will have our last combined summer service. If you just think about it, in August, we're going to go back to our 830 and 1045 service. Because I know, like I do, you, you can hear that rumbling, right? It's like a little bit of an earthquake while thousands and thousands of students are on their way to Oxford uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, we're looking forward to all of that coming back. So, but next week, this next week, we will have just one service next week. Don't get confused. We'll make sure we communicate with you plenty on that one. Don't forget about men's Bible study on Tuesday and all the women's activities going on Wednesday and Pilates tomorrow night. We hope you're enjoying your summer as it comes into an end. But in the meantime, receive a good word from the Lord as he says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. Go in peace. <laughs> Little Thatcher.